All right, so get ready because this one is about you. Yeah, you and like not just your family tree, but like the deep history of you on a biological level. Exactly, your origin story. And and you've given us some fascinating stuff to dive into for this one. Oh yeah, Darwin's writings, the OG, modern genetics, even like reflections on consciousness. Really bringing it all together. It's like we're tracing your lineage back to the dawn of time on the genetic level. So the code of life DNA. Yeah. But where does Darwin fit into all of this? A guy from like forever ago. See, that's the thing. Darwin's ideas are the foundation. Mm -hmm. His work, though written over a century ago, explains how that DNA code that you're talking about has changed over millions of years. Okay, so Darwin 101. Hit me with the key concepts, like the Spark Notes version. All right, well, it all starts with natural selection. Survival of the fittest. That's what people think, yeah. Right. But it's not really about being the strongest or the fastest. Okay. It's about being good enough to survive. And this is key pass on your genes. So, like, if you're better suited to your environment, exactly. you're more likely to, well, have kids. And they'll inherit those traits, you know, that and helped you survive. Gotcha. So, over time, those tiny advantages add up. Right. And that leads to the mind-blowing diversity of life we see today. Like Darwin's finches, right. Perfect example. Different beaks based on what they were eating on each island. Spot on. Each species adapting to its own little niche. I always loved that example. Yeah, it's a classic. So we've all got this DNA code right. shaped by like millions of years of survival. A long, long time. But how does my DNA become, well, mine? Well, it starts with your parents, right? Okay. Their DNA combines to create your own unique blueprint. But it goes deeper than that. Way deeper. You've got sexual selection you know, who you pick as a partner, and then there are mutations. Mutations. Mm. Those are like typos in the DNA code, right? Yeah. Exactly. Aren't those usually bad? We tend to think that because of, you know, superhero movies. Right, right. But actually, mutations are the source of all that variation that natural selection acts on. Huh. Without them, we all be identical. So, like, nature's experimenting. Exactly. Trying out new combinations. So mutations can be good. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. Interesting. Imagine, like, a mutation makes you a little taller. Okay. Or better at digesting certain foods mm -hmm. or more resistant to a disease. And if it gives you an edge. You're more likely to have kids, and that mutation gets passed on. So all those tiny changes over millions of years. Millions. Led to me. Sitting here right now. And here's another wild thought. Okay. All humans, every single one of us, mm -hmm. can trace our ancestry back to Africa. So we're all related. We are. Every bit of your DNA represents countless ancestors who survived for you to be here. Wow, that's a lot to take in. It is. But we're not done yet, right? Yep. So far we've talked about, like, the physical evolution, the DNA. But what about, like, the evolution of our minds? Ah, uh, yes. Consciousness. This is where things get really interesting. The source material suggests that consciousness is like a virtual simulator. Like my brain's running simulations all the time. Like a what-if machine. What? It takes in information from your senses and creates these models of the world. So my brain's like a flight simulator. In a way, yeah. Yeah. Helping you make decisions, avoid danger. Okay, I think I'm starting to get it. It's what separates us from other animals, this ability to simulate. Right, because animals just react. Right. They don't really think about it. That's their first nature. Instinct. Got it. But humans, we have that second nature. We can reflect, imagine, ask why. So when I'm debating what to have for dinner... Second nature in action. I love this. And this ability to question, to ponder the why, is what's driven so much of human progress, wouldn't you say? It's like the heart of science, philosophy, art. It all comes back to this amazing simulation process that our brains have evolved to do. So, if my brain is so good at simulating reality, uh -huh. does that mean I always see the world objectively? Now, that's a great question. Is my perception always accurate? Well, our brains are powerful, mm -hmm. but they're not perfect. Oh. Sometimes our simulations can lead to illusions. Illusions. And biases. Like, my brain can lie to me. Let me give you an example. This is a good one from the source material. Okay. The animating brain versus the non-animating brain. Why? Imagine two early humans hear a rustle in the bushes. Mm -hmm. One, with an animating brain, assumes it's a predator and runs. Okay. The other, non-animating brain, dismisses it as just the wind. So one's paranoid and one's like, chill. 
Who's more likely to survive a real threat? The paranoid one. Exactly. Yeah. So sometimes it's better to be safe than sorry. Even if it means being a little delusional. In a way, yes. Our brains evolved to keep us alive, not to be perfectly objective. Makes sense. It's about making predictions that help you survive. Right, so my brain's trying to keep me alive, even if it means exaggerating the danger sometimes. Precisely. So maybe our brains prioritize survival over accuracy. It's a built-in safety mechanism. But if we're constantly running these simulations, mm. imagining all these possibilities, yeah. does that mean we even have free will? Ah, free will. The big question. Right. Well, the source material hints at a possible connection between our evolved consciousness and the illusion of free will. Whoa, wait. Illusion? Think about it. Okay. We play out scenarios in our heads, weigh options, consider consequences. Right, that's what we do. But what if that feeling of making a choice, that sense of control, is just another product of our evolution? Instead of, like, my soul making the decision. Maybe it's just our brains doing what they do best, firing neurons, making calculations based on our experiences and genes. But it feels so real. Exactly. And that's the beauty of it. Our brains create this incredibly convincing illusion. Like a virtual reality experience. So immersive that we forget it might not be real. Whoa. So are we just biological machines then? I wouldn't say that. No free will. Just pre-programmed responses. I think it's more nuanced than that. Okay. We still experience the world. We still make decisions. We still learn and grow. Mm -hmm. Our brains are incredibly complex. Yeah. And we're only just beginning to understand how they work. So it's not about free will versus, like, determinism. I think it's about recognizing the complexity of the human experience. The interplay of biology and consciousness. Exactly. Nature and nurture. Okay, so we've got these incredible brains. Amazing, really. Capable of all this amazing stuff. Right. But they're also flawed. They have their quirks. We talked about those brain lies, mm. exaggerating threats, the illusion of free will. Right. What other ways can our brains trip us up? Think about optical illusions. Oh, yeah. They mess with how our brains process visual information. It's like you see things that aren't really there. Or cognitive biases, like confirmation bias. Confirmation bias. It's where we tend to favor information that supports our existing beliefs. I think I do that. Even if it's inaccurate. It's like our brains are saying, I already believe this, so this new evidence must be true. It's like when you're doom scrolling on social media yes. and you only see posts that like reinforce your worldview. <laughs> exactly. Our brains love patterns and predictability. So we create these echo chambers. We want to make sense of the world. Mm. Minimize surprises. But that can be dangerous, right? It can. Sometimes that means clinging to beliefs that make us feel comfortable. Even if they're not true. It's not always intentional, though. Okay. It's our brains trying to create a coherent story. Even if they have to fudge the details a bit. You got it. So how do we fight these biases? Can we reprogram our brains to be, be more objective? Is that possible? I don't think it's about eliminating biases completely. Okay. But about becoming aware of them, mm -hmm. recognizing that we all have these mental shortcuts, okay. these tendencies to see the world in a certain way. That's the first step. That's the first step. And then what? From there, we can practice things like actively seeking out diverse viewpoints. Even if it's uncomfortable. Especially if it's uncomfortable. Gotcha. It's also important to cultivate a healthy skepticism. Question everything. Don't just accept things at face value. Dig deeper. Ask questions. Be open to the possibility that you might be wrong. Exactly. That's hard, but good advice. It is hard. It's like a mental detox. I like that. Clearing out the cobwebs. Making sure our beliefs are based on evidence. Not just what we want to believe. Like an ongoing process. But worth it. Absolutely. So our brains are these amazing but flawed machines. I wouldn't trade them for anything. But enough about us for a minute. But Let's get back to Darwin before yeah. we went down this rabbit hole. I know, it's fascinating stuff. We were talking about his like unconventional path to becoming Darwin. Mm-hmm. What other key moments shaped his journey? Well, he talks about his struggles with math mm -hmm. in his autobiography. Really? And how he almost gave up on geology because the lectures were so boring. It's kind of comforting to know that even Darwin had weaknesses. Right. He wasn't just born a genius. He had to work at it, just like the rest of us. Exactly. And he was self-aware, too. Mm -hmm. He knew his limitations. And he sought out people who could help him. Like mentors. Exactly. Like Professor Henslow. It's like that saying, if you want to go fast, 
go alone. Yeah. If you want to go far, go together. Even brilliant minds need a support system. People to bounce ideas off of. And to challenge their assumptions. Darwin's story also shows how, like, random events can shape your life. Oh, absolutely. Like, he talks about how he stumbled upon Malthus's essay, Essay on the Principle of Population, right. while just reading for fun. And that sparked a key insight. Like the universe was giving him a hint. It's amazing how these things happen. It wasn't just luck, right? No, of course not. He also put in the work. Years of research. Refining his ideas. He was patient and persistent. He didn't just rush to publish. He carefully crafted his arguments. Anticipated objections. Talked to his colleagues. Wow. Dedication. It was a testament to his scientific rigor. So it was curiosity, open-mindedness, hard work. And a bit of luck. That all led Darwin to his theory. It's amazing, isn't it? And that theory changed everything. It's the foundation of modern biology. And its influence goes way beyond science, too. Oh, yeah. Philosophy, psychology, even economics. It's incredible how one person's curiosity can have such a huge impact. Darwin's story is truly inspiring. I agree. It reminds you that big ideas often come from humble beginnings. Absolutely. And that even the most complex theories can be traced back to simple observations. And asking why. It's been an incredible journey so far, exploring Darwin DNA and like what it means to be human. We've covered a lot. But we're not done yet. More to come. When we come back, we'll dive even deeper into these ideas. And what they mean for you, the listener. Stay tuned. Okay, so before the break, we're talking about Darwin. Yeah, not exactly the straight A student. Beetle obsessed and all right, makes yeah. you feel better about your own uh, quirks. Little bit, yeah. So, what were some of those turning points for him? You know, those moments that led him to change how we understand life itself. It's interesting how random events can shape a life. Oh, for sure. Like Darwin went to Cambridge uh -huh. to study theology. Wait, theology? Yeah. The father of evolution almost became a priest. Almost. That's wild. But luckily for science, right. he got really into natural history. Ah, so he switched gears. He had this mentor, Professor Henslow. I love a good mentor story. Who really opened his eyes to like the wonders of the natural world. Cool. And encouraged him to pursue science. Okay, but we can't talk about Darwin without talking about the Beagle. Oh, of course. That famous voyage. Five years. Five years. No. What was the impact of that? I mean, imagine sailing around the world for five years, yeah. seeing all these incredible places. Rainforests, the Galapagos. It was during that voyage that the seeds for his theory were planted. So it was like a five-year nature documentary. But with higher stakes. Right, right. He was seeing evolution in action. What were some of those aha moments for him? Well, the Galapagos finches, of course. The classic example. He noticed that finches on different islands had unique beaks yeah. adapted to the specific food they ate. It's like nature was giving him a demo. Exactly. Yeah. And then there were the fossils. Fossils? He found fossils of extinct creatures mm -hmm. that resembled modern species. So that suggests that life is constantly changing. Evolving over millions of years. So when Darwin got back to England, he had all these pieces of the puzzle. He was ready to put them together. But he didn't rush to publish, did he? No, he was meticulous. He wanted to make sure he got it right. He spent years collecting more evidence. Wow. Refining his arguments. That's dedication. He didn't publish on the origin of species until over two decades after his voyage. 20 years. That's a long time to sit on a masterpiece. Okay, but let's go back to this idea of consciousness as a simulator. Okay, yeah. It's fascinating, but I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. The big concept. If our brains are creating these simulations, mm -hmm. how do we know what's real? Right. Is everything just like a construct of our minds? That's the question, isn't it? Yeah. Philosophers have been debating that for centuries. Right, right. But from an evolutionary perspective, okay. maybe the more important question is, does it even matter if it's real as long as it helps us survive? So you're saying that a little delusion might be beneficial. Maybe. Evolutionarily speaking. Think about it. Okay. If our ancestors were constantly second-guessing their perceptions. Like, is that a tiger or just the wind? Exactly. They might not have reacted quickly enough. Sometimes it's better to overreact. Than to underreact. Even if it means being wrong sometimes. So our brains prioritize survival. Over accuracy. Like a safety mechanism. Yeah. But if our brains are so good at simulating... At imagining different possibilities. But does that mean we have free will? 
or are we just puppets of our biology? That's the question. Right. The source material talks about a possible connection between consciousness and the illusion of free will. Illusion. Think about how our consciousness works. Okay. We play out scenarios. We weigh options. Consider consequences. It feels like we're in control. Exactly. But what if that feeling of control is just another product of our evolution? What if it's not some separate force? Instead of like, my soul making the decision. It could just be our brains doing their thing. Firing neurons. Making calculations. But it feels so real. That's the crazy part, right? It does. Our brains create this incredibly convincing illusion. So are we just biological machines then? No free will, just pre-programmed responses. It's kind of a depressing thought. I think it's more nuanced than that. Okay. We still experience the world. We still make decisions. We still have the capacity to learn and grow. Our brains are incredibly complex. And we're only just beginning to understand them. So it's not about free will versus is determinism. It's about recognizing the complexity of being human. The interplay of biology and consciousness. Exactly. Nature and nurture. Okay, so we've got these incredible brains. Capable of amazing things. But they also have limitations. We've talked about some of them. The brain lies, exaggerating threats. The illusion of free will. What other ways can our brains trip us up? Well, think about optical illusions. Oh, yeah, those are fun. They play with how our brains process visual information. You see things that aren't really there. Or cognitive biases, like confirmation bias. Information bias. Where we favor information that supports what we already believe. Even if it's wrong. It's like our brains are saying, I already believe this, so this new evidence must be true. It's like when you're scrolling through social media. And you only see posts that reinforce your worldview. Even if it's a skewed view. Our brains love patterns, predictability. So we create these echo chambers. They want to make sense of the world. Minimize surprises. But that can be dangerous, right? It can lead us to cling to beliefs that make us comfortable. Even if they're not true. It's not always intentional, though. Okay. It's our brains trying to create a coherent story. Even if they have to, like, fudge the details? Exactly. So how do we fight these biases? Can we reprogram our brains to be more objective? Is that possible? Well, I don't think it's about eliminating them completely. Okay. But about becoming aware of them. So recognizing that we have these mental shortcuts. These tendencies to see the world in a certain way. That's the first step. That's the first step. And then what? We could practice things like actively seeking out different viewpoints. Even if it's uncomfortable. Especially if it's uncomfortable. And cultivate a healthy skepticism. Question everything. Don't just accept things at face value. Dig deeper. Ask questions. Be open to being wrong. That's hard. It is. But it's good advice. That's like a mental detox. I like that. Cleaning out the cobwebs. Making sure our beliefs are based on evidence. And not just what we want to believe. It's an ongoing process, but worth it. Absolutely. Okay, so enough about our amazing, flawed brains. For now. Let's get back to Darwin. Back to the man himself. Before the break, we were talking about his path to becoming Darwin. Right, right. What else shaped his thinking? Well, he talks about his struggles with math in his autobiography. Really? Darwin. Yeah, he almost gave up on geology, too. Why? The lectures were so boring. It's kind of comforting to know that even Darwin had weaknesses. It makes him seem more human. Right, like he wasn't just born a genius. He had to work at it. And he was really self-aware, too. He was. He knew his limitations. And he sought out people to help him. Like his mentor, Professor Henslow. Exactly. He needed people to bounce ideas off of, challenge his thinking. It's like that saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. Yeah. If you want to go far, go together. True. Darwin's story also shows how random events can change your life. Yeah. He talks about how he just happened to read Malthus's essay. Essay on the principle of population. Yeah, while well, he was just relaxing. And that sparked a key insight for his theory. It's like the universe was dropping him a hint. It's amazing how those things happen. But he still put in the work. Years of research. Refining his ideas. Being meticulous. He didn't rush to publish. He wanted to get it right. So it was curiosity, open-mindedness, hard work. And a bit of luck that led him to his theory. Which changed everything. And it goes way beyond science, too. Oh, yeah. It's influenced philosophy, psychology, even economics. It's incredible how one person can have such a huge impact. It really is. Darwin's story is inspiring, though. It is. It reminds you that big ideas can have humble beginnings. That was true. That even the most complex theories can come from simple observations. And a willingness to ask why. 
So, this has been quite a journey. We've covered a lot. Exploring Darwin, DNA, and what it means to be human. The big questions. Uh, we're not done yet. We'll be right back. To dive even deeper into these ideas and what they mean for you, the listener. Okay, so we're back and ready for the final stretch of our deep dive. Into you. The Darwinian you. The DNA you. The thinking, feeling, questioning you. It's been uh, quite the journey so far. Weren't you say? We've covered a lot of ground, that's for sure. From natural selection to consciousness as a virtual simulator. And Darwin's own path, from beetle enthusiast to scientific icon. We talk about how your DNA is like a story of survival, right? A testament to countless ancestors who beat the odds so you could be here. It makes you feel kind of, I don't know, special in a way. It's a humbling thought, for sure. And we explored those three pounds of meat in our heads, the brain. Amazing organs. Capable of simulating reality, but also like prone to biases and illusions. Those brain lies were a bit of a reality check. Yeah, it made me question everything for a minute there. But it's all part of understanding how we work. So before we go full existential crisis mode, let's bring it all home. Okay. What does this all mean for the listener? Why should they care about Darwin, DNA, and consciousness? Like, what's the takeaway here? Because Darwin's legacy isn't just some old theory. Right. It's woven into who you are. Okay. Your body, your mind, your very existence is a product of millions of years of evolution. So I'm not just a random collection of cells. You are a product of an incredible process. A walking, talking testament to natural selection. You could say that. <laughs> That's kind of epic when you put it like that. It is pretty remarkable. It's like a reminder that we're part of something bigger. Than ourselves. Understanding this deep history it gives you a new perspective. On your place in the world. Like we're all connected. To each other. To all living things. To the entire history of life on Earth. And we're still evolving, really. Oh, from Who knows what the future holds. That's the exciting part. So last thought to ponder as we wrap up. The big one. If our brains are these virtual simulators. Capable of amazing things. But also prone to biases. How can we, like, hack our own thinking? How can we make better decisions, you know? Be more aware of our limitations. Any tips for our listeners? It starts with awareness, recognizing that we all have these biases. Okay. From there, we can try to seek out different viewpoints. Even if it's uncomfortable. Especially if it's uncomfortable. Challenge our own beliefs. Exactly. Be more skeptical. Don't just believe everything you hear. It's about being curious, open-minded. Willing to change your mind. Recognizing that our understanding is always evolving. It's like life itself. So there you have it. The Darwinian you. The DNA you. The conscious questioning you. It's a lot to process. It's a lot to think about. But hopefully it's given you a sense of wonder. About your place in the universe. So keep asking questions. Keep exploring. Keep learning. And remember, your journey of discovery is just beginning. Thanks for joining us on this incredible adventure. It's been a pleasure. Until next time, keep diving deep. Mm -hmm.